going to give this to you. And then, uh, so Jaina is, why don't you tell them a little bit about yourself. Sure. So, hi, I'm a parent of uh, both public and private school students in Seattle. I've been on the West Coast for four years. I work for an organization. I'm the executive director of Partnership for Learning, which is affiliated with the Washington Roundtable. Uh, we've been around since 1994 to focus on improving education for all students in Washington State. Uh, this is an area of interest of mine. I've worked in education for 25 years, devoted my life to social equity and to making sure that all students, not just my own, uh, have a good chance at succeeding in education and going on uh, to two or four year college or apprenticeship or whatever it is that's going to allow them to earn a family wage. So uh, I am here, I'm part of the coalition, the Yes on 1240 coalition, and representing myself, but also the campaign, and then Partnership for Learning and the Roundtable to be totally transparent, but both endorsed uh, I-1240 as something that they see as important to further education and make sure that we have good results for all kids. Uh, and better chances of educating our future workforce in this state. Good. Thank you for allowing Thank you. us well, to come. Just want you to have a moment. Eric uh, Boomhagen is uh, going to is part of the No on Initiative 1240. And Eric, why don't you take the mic for a few moments and tell people about yourself? Thank you. Um, I am a parent of two children. Uh, one of my long-suffering daughters is actually still volunteering to come to these, even after coming to two or three of them. Um, uh, thank, you, thank you for coming. I've, I've lived in Seattle for 19 years now. I came here uh, after moving around a lot to uh, University of Washington and fell in love with the city and, and never left. Um, we've ra raised our two children in Seattle Public Schools. Uh, uh, my uh, younger daughter and, and my older daughter before are at Loyal Heights Elementary out in Ballard on the, on the water on the other side. Um, my older daughter is at Ingram High School. And I've been active for uh, close to 10 years in, the, uh, in our local PTAs. Um, I'm the legislative committee chair for our, for our PTA, although this is not part of that, that particular role. Um, they call me the dark cloud of doom at the PTA meetings um, because I always seem to be bringing bad news. But uh, I, I'm um, a volunteer with the uh, No on 1240 campaign. Good. Thanks very much, Eric. I thought that the, uh, I'm going to change the format of what I had in mind a little bit because it, it, it occurred to me that perhaps the most reasonable way of proceeding is, number one, to give the pro on, uh, on 1240 the first track crack, and we thought we'd give you 10 minutes to sort of summarize your position, and then uh, let Eric do the same, and then uh, I think I'm gonna give you each a chance uh, for five minutes or so to rebut the other, the other person's arguments. Does that sound like a fair approach? Sure. Okay, you're on. Yeah, so I think that's probably, see? whatever you're comfortable with. Okay, I can do that. Um, I do have additional information here if you uh, would like to see it. There's, uh, so basically I, I mentioned that I've devoted my life to education and social equity issues and making sure that all children in this country have an opportunity for sound schooling and future success in, in life and work. There are, and this, for this reason, I, I see charter schools as one opportunity to provide that for students. It's not a panacea, it's not something that's gonna solve all of our educational problems. We all know that public schools, traditional public schools are serving many children well, and many children well in Washington State, but not all children well. Uh, and charter schools have been found to serve uh, struggling students more effectively than traditional public schools. So this may not be the case in your local schools or in your neighborhood, but it's certainly the case in other parts of, of Washington and other parts of even Seattle, unfortunately. Uh, so there are four reasons why charter schools are on the ballot for November. Um, well, first of which is, is a big one, which is that since charter schools were brought to Washington State voters, uh, it's been 10 years, almost eight years, uh, 120,000 students have dropped out of high school. Um, and annually, in 
Seattle, that's close to 600 students drop out each year. And so a real civil rights and equity issue is associated with that. But charter schools are public schools. Don't let anyone tell you differently. They're, they're um, public schools. They're funded through public dollars. Uh, and they have to, the, the way that the legislation, or excuse me, the initiative has been written is that uh, the teachers have to be certificated. The schools have to follow the same standards as traditional public schools. They do have flexibility, and this is one of the uh, pieces that they're known uh, to, this, this is why the charter schools were started, was really to provide flexibility and innovation in terms of how they deliver that curriculum, how they meet the needs of the students best, how they differentiate instruction, how, do they lengthen the school day, do they, do they provide more um, support for certain kinds of students. And again, the priority in this particular initiative is for struggling students. Uh, nobody has to attend or select a charter school or put one in their neighborhood, but the point is that because they're public schools, the money follows the students, the teachers are certificated, and they have to follow the same standards and rules and regulations as other schools. They have flexibility in how they organize the school day and differentiate instruction and meet the needs of students. Uh, and so those schools can be tailored to meet the needs of students. Um, my son attends Garfield, and you know he's lucky enough to be in the APP program. Uh, but Garfield's a very segregated school, and the kids at Garfield do not have equity of educational access or equity of educational experience. And while it's benefited my child tremendously, it abhors me as um, somebody who's focused on social equity and social justice to see how uh, the rules differ based on who the student is and whether or not they've been in APP since they were in kindergarten or uh, whatever test they, they had to take. And, and that the rigorous instruction and the support provided to students is not delivered in an equitable manner. Uh, the second reason is I-1240 brings to Washington State the best of what has been in place in other states across the country. And I think you're aware that 41 other states have charter schools. Yes, there's been a mixed record, not mixed with struggling students, however, and not mixed when there's an effective charter school law that requires strict over oversight, accountability, and then evaluation. So when policy has been indicated and deliberated in a way that provides the strict oversight and accountability and clear regulation and clear uh, accountability, charter schools have performed better. And so what we did was we took the best of what has worked in other states, looked at the research, looked at the data, worked with national uh, charter school organizations, and said, what is it that has facilitated effective and best practice instruction for struggling students in other states? And that's what has appeared in this particular um, piece of, uh, this, it's not a piece of legislation, sorry, it's an initiative. And so we've had, and, and there are more than 31 requirements in, in the initiative that stipulate what indeed a charter has to look like and, and what charter operators have to provide. So another piece is that 41 other states, parents in 41 other states have this option. It's not an economic option. It's not whether or not they live in a particular neighborhood or they can afford property values in a certain area and therefore their schools are better than in other areas. This is an option that is a public school option. And so the, the big point here is that I would like my opponent to really say why it is that we in Washington State should continue to deny families and children in Washington State an opportunity that 41 other states have. And by the way, there's states with whom we're competing their states, um, all of our surrounding states, we're the only state with an urban corridor that does not have a charter school, let, does not have charter schools authorized. Um, and we also, I, if, you've, if you've heard Brad Smith from Microsoft last week or looked at this uh, major announcement, they can't it, uh, hire the talent from in-state that they need to fill their jobs. And when we look forward 10 years from now, we're looking at more and more jobs that require higher levels of education, and our students are not only not graduating, uh, we have about 75% of students graduate in four years, um, and a very small percentage of those graduates go on and, and end up with a baccalaureate after 
uh, four years. So it's like it's 10%. And in the STEM, science, technology, engineering, and math areas, it's much lower. So what charter schools do is provide another option to families who don't otherwise have them, and to students who might not be well served by a traditional public school or might just want a different choice. Uh, the, the fourth reason is that traditional public schools have served many children well. They've served my children well, actually two, two of my three children well, one not so well. And I've had the economic opportunity to, to make a different choice or the knowledge of the education system that allowed me to either argue for a different situation within the public schools or to move her to a different option because I knew that she would thrive in a, in a different kind of learning environment. So that, that knowledge and that ability to navigate systems as well as the economic ability allowed me to broker choice. But charter schools have cracked the code when it comes to working with struggling students. Uh, when you look at research studies, students who are best served by charter schools are students who are low income and students of color. And this is to provide them with a choice. And also, uh, when you look at Washington State achievement data, Washington State is one of the only states in the country where our achievement gap, which is the difference between uh, students of color and white students is growing, or low-income students and more affluent students, it's growing. We're not serving all of our students well, and this is an option. And so I urge you to look further, and I do, as I said, have some information, and I'm here to answer questions for you. But to look further and to think beyond your neighborhood and think of, again, this, this is our state that we're thinking about. This is what happens for all of our students. It's not just what happens for our neighborhood, because clearly, you're very invested in what's happening here, and you're going to make sure that you're, you're involved in your schools, that your schools are strong, but not every community has the kinds of options that you have here. Thank you very much. Okay. Thanks, Sharon. Can we ask questions? Yeah, uh, after the presentation. Okay, Can you just make a clarifying statement? That mic is not... That mic needs to be held to their mouth so people can hear. Oh, I'm sorry. Is that okay. the right? Yeah, we just have some people who have yeah. hearing. So I'm starting to be there. So. Okay. Thanks, Caleb. Eric? And please, if you're not hearing me, um, give, give me a signal, and I'll be happy to, to change the mic. Um, one of the big challenges with Initiative 1240 is that it's about aspirations. And the, the um, campaign for, and particularly the way the initiative itself is drafted, is about aspirations. And we all want there to be, a, we all want schools to be better. We all want kids to do better. Um, and I'm going to answer, first of all, the, um, the challenge that, that you gave me at the very beginning and say that it's not that I think that public schools are perfect. Um, they're not. I've spent a lot of time at school boards, at school board meetings, telling them that they're wrong and that they're making a terrible decision. Um, it's not that I think that all charter schools are bad. They're not. There's are certainly charter schools that, that do better um, than, their, than their peers. The problem is that when you look at the averages, and yes, there are some schools, charter schools, that do better, but the um, Stanford University did a study, and they came up with, um, across 16 states, 17% of charter schools did better than the school next door. 37% did worse. So it's less a question of a challenge for, for why we don't want a, a better education uh, system for our children, it's why would we do something that is demonstrably worse for many students, the same for most, and better for a few. Um, now, I really hear what, what Jana was saying about uh, Garfield. Um, we're very fortunate that at Ingram High School, uh, where my older daughter goes, um, the access to the honors classes is determined solely by uh, whether the student wants to be in that class. Um, anybody can come from any class and enter the International Baccalaureate program. It doesn't matter whether they were in the APP program, it doesn't matter what uh, middle school or elementary school they came from, they can do that. 
and if they want to apply themselves to that program and do the um, incredible amount of work that that, that, that is, that, that my older daughter's doing right now, um, they can be there. So the question isn't really, why are we denying this? It's, there's certainly an excellent question to the school board to be asked here, why is Garfield so different from Ingram? Why does it have to be so different? But the answer isn't charter schools necessarily. The answer is to run our public schools better. Um, and I'd also like to address the issue of social equity. Um, there's, there's the, the same Stanford study um, came out, uh, one of their conclusions that was for blacks and Hispanics, their learning gains are significantly worse than their traditional school twins. Um, and, and we also we talk about you know, the initiative, which is here, actually goes and says, I, I want to read this from you. you know, we, talk, we, we hear a lot about how this is going to serve at-risk students. So I'm reading directly from the initiative. Nothing in this chapter may be construed to limit the establishment of charter schools to those that serve at-risk students or restrict, limit, or discourage the establishment of charter schools that enroll and serve other pupil populations. We don't have to have charter schools for at-risk students. That's what that says. They can be anywhere. So let's just say for a moment that somebody wants to open the um, uh, Madison Beach bathhouse uh, charter school. We're going to have a one-room schoolhouse right here. Um, and I'm, this, is, this is purely hypothetical. There's going to be 30 kids here, uh, one or two teachers, and it's going to go K through 5. Um, so the money follows the student, right? So all the state money will, will come, uh, you know, will, will uh, follow the student from the uh, Seattle Public Schools with, with classes. So how's that impacting our, our public schools around here? Well, what if 10 of those students come from Montlake? and 10 come from McGilvra, and 10 come from Madrona. Um, each of those schools will lose about $50,000 a year in state funding. Um, that's about half of a full-time person, uh, in, just in, in ballpark terms. Now, they've just lost uh, one or two people, one or two kids per grade. They can't reduce their, um, their costs any. They can't reduce the number of teachers. They can't reduce the number of staff. So when you look at it from the whole city, nobody's really lost anything. But when you look at the individual school, the public school has lost a lot of, a lot of money there. And it hurts the schools. And like we said, the state Supreme Court has said in the McCleary decision, we are, our state funding situation for public schools is unconstitutional. We are failing our duty to our students. Um, and that's part of why we don't have many of the programs that we, that, we, uh, th that we need to make our students be successful. is because we are in the high 40s of per student state funding nationwide. We're down there with Mississippi and Alabama. Thank God for them or we might be number 50. Um, that's why. So you talk about why, why we aren't going to college or careers, it's because the Seattle School District had to cut career counselors, because we don't have the money. Now, I wish they would found something else to cut, but if, before we start blaming the public schools for the failures, and there certainly have been failures, and before we start pulling money out of those schools, we need to solve the basic problem, which is we haven't given them the money to do their job, the resources to do their job. Now, I want, also want to talk a little bit about oversight. Um, oversight by the, under Initiative 1240 is provided by the Charter Commission. This is a statewide, um, new statewide bureaucracy. It has nine members. Three of them are appointed by the governor. Three of them are appointed by the president of the Senate. Three of them are appointed by the um, Speaker of the House in the legislature. Um, all of them, every single one of them, has to have a commitment to charter schooling. So what that means is that oversight is being done by the partisans. Um, it's like asking the fans of the football stadium to make the calls on the field. That's a terrible idea. It's a terrible idea. The other thing that that does is that it absolutely removes all public oversight from that commission. 
because if you want to go and talk to those, per those people on the Charter Commission, they have no need to talk to you. They're not accountable to you. They don't stand for election. They can't even be removed from office. There's no mechanism for impeachment in the initiative. Um, so we have the oversight being done by the fans who don't have to listen to us. Now, that charter commission then negotiates with each charter school for their contract. All of those 32 points that Jana was talking about are in the charter contract. So depending on how hard a bargain the charter commission strikes will depend on what kind of oversight you see. Also, you see, if you look at the initiative, you'll see that some of those 32 points are things like um, an executive summary. Um, where is the school going to be? Uh, how are they going to find teachers? It's a little bit like going in for your tune-up with your 32-point inspection and the first three items on there are um, does your car still have an engine, does it have doors, and does it still have wheels? Um, it, it's, it, 32 sounds like a really big number, but a lot of those things are really very basic and don't provide effective oversight. Am I running up on time? You're, you're getting close. Okay. Um, so, um, the other, the last thing on that charter commission is that 4% of all the state money from the uh, charter schools, given to a charter school, will go back to that charter commission to pay for their oversight. So in addition to pulling money from all the other schools, we're pulling state money out of the schools for another layer of bureaucracy. This is absolutely the wrong solution right now for charter schools, for everyone. Um, so I agree that charter schools have done some really great work in other places. This initiative does not make them bring that great work to Washington, and it also harms our schools that are critically short of funding. Thank you. Thanks very much. If I can uh, give you a chance for a response, sure. if you would, please. Thank you. Thank you, Eric, for raising those points. Um, I think we definitely have some different interpretations of some of the studies. He mentioned a Stanford study, which was not, by the way, peer-reviewed. Uh, it also, as Eric did mention, uh, it included only 17 states of 41. Uh, and it was, they were aggregate numbers, and they also, the Stanford study very clearly concluded that policy matters, that strong policies make a difference in state performance. Uh, Follow-up studies by Harvard and MIT of New York City and Boston, uh, as, as well as a third state, uh, did show that charters have done a good job with struggling students when you disaggregated by the type of school, the type of policy the state had, uh, and so, so there have been follow-up studies that, that do show some differences. Yes, there have been good and bad charter schools, and, and uh, just like we have good and bad traditional public schools. Uh, but this particular initiative has been written, so because of the public oversight to which Eric alluded, uh, the annual performance reviews, our traditional public schools don't even have annual performance reviews. We have more than 300 persistently low achieving schools across the state, and the state has not intervened in those schools to close them or to, turn them, or, or to sufficiently turn them around. So you have students who have been in failing schools year after year after year. That won't happen with this, these uh, publicly authorized charter schools. Uh, so, so those are the, the other piece has to do with funding. Yes, we have a funding problem in our state. Can we wait until all of our schools are excellent for this generation of students to have the opportunity for an excellent school? I say no. Uh, and as, as I indicated, people aren't forced to, to choose charter schools. Uh, it's, it's up to their parents, and it's up to the student, and it's up to their learning style whether or not that's something that they want to do. Educators also do not have to teach uh, or uh, lead in public charter schools. Again, it's for those who really want to work in that kind of environment, who want to innovate, and who want to differentiate the instruction to serve certain kinds of students. There are tremendous educators throughout our system, and we're trying, and Partnership for Learning, my organization, has been working for, as I mentioned, since 1994 on education reform in the state. Yes, funding has um, diminished, and we do not stack up well to other states, 
but charter schools have actually demonstrated per pupil expenditure for them um, in most states, they get at least $2,000 per student less than traditional public school students get, and they get better results, even with the diminished dollars. So they actually can bring economies of scale into, into the system uh, that we're not having in our, our more bureaucratic environments. And believe me, I've been, I've worked in an urban school district, I've worked in the superintendent's office, I know what it takes to run uh, urban school systems. And there, there are no panaceas, and systemic change is very difficult to, to work out. That doesn't mean that we're not going to continue as a country uh, and as a state to work on those very, what see, are seemingly intractable problems, including the financing. Uh, and we have a very significant gubernatorial race coming up uh, that both people are speaking about education, education financing, and, a lot, and I urge you to continue to hear and listen really think about what people are saying and how they're going to address these systemic problems because they're critical. Charter schools are one strategy, one strategy that 41 other states have, all of them in competition with us, uh, all of them with urban corridors, and we don't have it as a tool in our toolbox. So I urge you to think about that as a strategy. Thank you. Good. Thanks, John. Eric, response? Um, I'm glad Jana mentioned um, New York because there were some recent news reports out over the summer that the uh, state of New York is having trouble closing charter schools that are failing. They can't close their failing charter schools because the people who are supervising them are too emotionally invested in making the school succeed. And so those students are being failed by their charter school and they're not getting closed. And, you know, it's, it's the same issue happens with um, public schools as well, but the idea that a charter school will magically get closed every time it is failing to meet its goals is um, it is not borne out by the evidence. Um, also, remember that all of those goals are set with that contract with the Charter Commission. Um, Jada made an excellent point about not having to choose the charters. That's actually not true. Um, the reason is that, that uh, 1240 has what's called charter conversions, which is where an outside group can come in and make a charter school out of a public school. What it takes is a petition of 50% of the teachers or 50% of the parents. So that's maybe 10 teachers or 200 parents in a, in a fairly large school. Um, now, they don't necessarily have to show that what the charter school is going to do before they circulate that petition, and there's no way to take your name off. When that happens, that charter school gets the building. They get all the students that are in there who want to stay. Um, everybody else has to go find their, own, find their own school. They get all of the levy money. They get all of the capital money that will go to that proportion of students in the school district. They get all of the state money. The district gets no revenue whatsoever. The charter school gets that building rent free from the district. Um, the charter commission and the charter school negotiate that rental contract. The school district doesn't even get a seat at the table for the rental contract for their own building. Uh, that is absolutely true, and it is in the initiative. The school um, district has the option to meet out the charter itself. Yeah, no, yeah you'll get a chance. Um, now, the, the question of less money. So, that leaves the district at a tremendous financial disadvantage because the charter school gets all of the money, not just the state money, but all of the money. And the district gets none of the revenue. Now, the issue of less money is very important too because charter schools actually take the less expensive students to teach. There was a, a study recently in Florida, and I'm sure Jane will talk about you know, different states, but they, they meet the same laws that, that we would have to, um, where 50% of charter schools didn't have a severely disabled student in the classrooms. 86% of public schools did. Now, just like health insurance, the school districts depend on having a large pool of kids who are relatively inexpensive to teach to cover those students who are very who are expensive to teach, such as children with su substantial disabilities. Um, charter schools skim that off, and I've seen that personally, actually. Um, my father-in-law is on the board of a charter school in, in Coeur d'Alene in Idaho, and they have regularly told students, you know, maybe you're not really cut out for this school. 
maybe you should go back to the regular public school. Um, and that happens. That happens um, in every state that charter schools are in, regardless of the policy. Okay. Um, I think I'll, I'll, I'll it was all right with you. I'm, well, actually, let me give you let me give you two minutes to fairly to respond, and I'll give Eric two minutes to respond to because I'm obviously there's something you wanted to uh, to add. The, I think the the main point is that charter schools under Initiative 1240 have to comply with all the laws and regulations that any traditional public school has to in the state. So they can't deny students access. Uh, they they require certification. Clearly, oversight is paramount, of paramount importance, Ab absolutely. Uh, the, the other piece is that districts, school boards can apply to be authorizers. They don't have to defer to a state authorizer. So if a school district is concerned about having charters crop up in, in their um, backyard, uh, they, they can be an authorizer, they can look at partnering and collaboration, and there are a lot of different examples across the country now uh, where you have charter, charters and traditional public schools collaborating to transfer best practices and to learn from each other and to work collaboratively, and that is the best model. An antagonistic model is, is not the best model. Uh, so we would certainly encourage that, and I think it is important to, uh, to look at who's on the commission and uh, to, to work with one's legislators to say, you know, to indicate that it's really important to have credible, capable people who are on, uh, on the commission, who are doing, looking at those, the annual review data and, and looking at the evaluation. So after five years, there's a formal evaluation uh, that is required by, by the initiative that basically says, should, you know, how are charter schools doing in the state? Should we increase the number from 40 which is a fairly modest number, allowing five to eight each year really to indicate are we making sure that we have high quality in the state. So yes, we want to make sure that, we, that the quality providers are here. They have to have demonstrated a track record in um, serving students well. And then in addition, the priority uh, is given to uh, those charters that serve struggling students. It's true that because we live in a democracy, anyone in Washington State or any community, if they wanted to look at having a charter in that community, they could. But we're looking for providers who have, the priority is given to providers who have demonstrated success with certain groups of students. So it's unlikely that those providers are gonna be attractive in any one community. They may be more, they're, they're likely if they're good at serving English language learner students or Latino students or immigrant students or uh, uh, African American males they're more likely to appeal to those, those customers than, than to other students who, who uh, may live in a community where charters are, are really not needed as much as they are in these more low-income communities. Okay, Gary. Um, those charter schools in Florida have to comply with all the same federal and state laws that the regular schools do. Um, there was also recently a case in Minnesota where a charter school decided that the 40 uh, special needs children that they had in that school um, were no longer going to be served at that school. They were going to send them back to the school district. They have to comply with all the same federal and state laws. Charter schools do not have a track record of serving everybody. And that's just, that's, that's the facts. Nationwide, they do not have that track, track record. Also, um, Jana brought up the issue of priority for um, who gets the priority for those slots. Um, the, the fact is that in the initiative, priority goes to the charter school that gets their contract signed with the authorizer first. Um, it's first come, first serve until, um, until the, all eight slots for that year are filled. Um, if two charter schools are, arrive at simultaneously, and we don't know what simultaneously means, um, to arrive simultaneously, it's a lottery. Which one gets chosen first? Which one actually gets to be formed? So it's not about which one serves the, the, the students best. It's about uh, which one gets there is, is first to the gate. Um, all the way through this initiative, we hear could and should and may and those kinds of words. They're very aspirational. We do not hear must. We do not hear shall. 
Um, I do regulatory compliance for a living. The difference between may and must is all the difference in the world. It's all the difference in the world. I-1240 is aspirational. It's all about may, it's not about must. Thank you. Okay, well thank you both. Um, uh, obviously this is a really complex, tough issue. Uh, and uh, all of us are gonna have to face up to uh, at uh, and, uh, either either on uh, November 5th or on um, a date earlier than that, since we get a chance to, uh, to vote as uh, early as three or four weeks before the actual election, uh, you're going to have a, a, a choice as to uh, which one of these which one of these positions you're going to favor. Can we ask uh, some questions, Abu? Yeah, that's just just about just about what I'm ready, ready to do, Betty. Uh, I would ask you to keep your questions short so we give everyone a chance. Uh, who wishes to ask a question to do so. David, can I ask you to help and maybe pass this mic to, to anyone who would like to ask a question? Okay, um, let me give precedence uh, to Betty. Betty, your question. I'm very stupid about uh, charter schools. I don't know how you get into them, and who applies, what happens with bus transportation uh, to the schools, do they have sports, do they compete? Uh, you know, with public schools and sports, I'm very stupid about all those aspects of it. So, John, so you want it, to take that one? Sure. It, it, all, it all depends on the charter. So not every, not every charter school uh, is going to provide sports. Uh, not every charter school is going to provide uh, transportation. So it depends on the charter. Uh, how that is is written up. Um, there, there's also so the the way that people don't apply. It's not like a private school where you have to get in and you have to show that you're worth getting in. Uh, it it's based on first come first serve. If there are more students than seats, just like there used to be in Seattle's when Seattle had public school choice, then students would go into a lottery system whereby. Uh, they would be allotted the seats based on, there's a, usually what there is called, it's a, um, I used to run placement, I'm trying to think what the word is, there's an algorithm that sorts based on making sure that you have ethnic diversity, you have, ge you have geographic diversity, and you have uh, income diversity. So the lotteries are meant to make it fair, not meant, so that's if they're over-enrolled. So you hear, you hear about charter lotteries, but the lotteries are not based on academic prowess or uh, the type of student that you are. Uh, so, so again, uh, they, they can offer all, all the services that traditional public schools do, but it depends on their size, it depends on their mission, it depends on what the students are there, wh why they're there. Okay. Anything you want to add to that there? Um, yes. Uh, the, the key thing is there, it depends. Um, you could have, for example, a charter school open in Magnolia offering no transportation. Um, and so that would basically only end up serving the kids in that neighborhood. Um, it'll depend with contracts that they have with the school district for sports and for other issues. Um, and the, if a charter school is over-enrolled, it's a straight-up lottery. It's a random choice through. It doesn't, I uh, don't believe there's any uh, waiting in there for, um, for uh, uh, diversity of, of, of any kind. Um, I'd be happy to look that up uh, in, the, in the initiative as we, as we go in there. And, and, Second like chapter and verse. Thank you. Okay, thank you. Um, okay, Nicole. So my question is, if it doesn't, if they're not going to automatically provide public transportation or bus transportation, and it's going to be based on, you know, wherever they, you know, you say it depends. And so, as much as I'm all for social equity and all of that, if you, if it, they don't have the transportation built in with the school, then and you say it's first come first serve, so then wouldn't the students who have transportation get to the school before the other students have a chance, the struggling students who would need the school the most? So again, the schools have specific foci or, or missions and, and they're tailored to the students who they intend, intend to serve and they locate in those areas where they intend for, for the student body. So, the um, I the the transportation piece is not such that it should be a barrier to entry. Um, it's 
and when we're for the for the most part, I, I, and I know the the depend the depends uh, seems to be an interesting refrain because the whole point of charters is to provide options, and it's not to provide uh, a boilerplate cookie cutter kind of education. So so they are tailored, and and their charters do differ, and that's the purpose of them. So. Uh, Certainly, one can find fault in that, um, but but that's that's their purpose. Their fundamental purpose is to innovate and to provide choice and options for students, and then also to tailor their mission and their program to certain groups of students and to certain um, locales. Yeah, just real quickly. Um, the kids in my neighborhood don't need more options for great schools. We have several great schools in the area, but there's nothing to stop a charter school from opening where there are lots of great schools as opposed to where they might do, you know, where the, the existing public schools are failing them. Um, so that is a, a case where the initiative is, is written poorly because it talks a lot about the importance of at-risk students and the focusing towards the at-risk students, but it doesn't actually make you do that, like that passage I read you there. The other thing is that you can come up with a focus, but that doesn't necessarily mean that that's what happens in reality. There's a school in California, the um, American Indian Charter School, that uh, has a population that's uh, something like 86% Asian. Um, they have a focus, but it's, it's not being met in practice. Okay, uh, Eleanor? Yeah, I've had uh, decades of working with children with uh, disabilities, and I can uh, verify what you said about private schools um, um, try to discourage parents from bringing their children with special needs to these private uh, programs because the function of the children will bring the stay nights or the performance of the schools down, so they, they may be um, um, legally supposed to uh, uh, accept the children, but they discourage the parents uh, because they these children require a tremendous amount of service, which I can't imagine a charter school is going to be able to provide the therapist and the other support service that the, the children need. Uh, and if the public schools have to provide these services, again, it would dilute what they provide in the schools. But the other um, concern I have is the, let's say the KIPP program, I forgot what it stands for, but it's known for excellence because um, the teachers are provided with extensive training and the quality of teaching is superior uh, to many other uh, programs. And I would prefer if the money would go into teaching, uh, providing this extra training in the public schools so we have a higher um, uh, degree of teacher excellence uh, for the struggling students where I think that the primary problem lies in the teacher quality. So, Eleanor, your question then is? I'm concerned that the charter schools are not addressing uh, teacher training, teacher excellence, teacher superiority that, that the kids would uh, find in the public schools, and also the kids with special needs will not be encouraged to, to okay. go to these programs. Okay, Jim. So it's interesting you pointed out that indeed a number of um, charter school teachers are excellent and superior uh, and they're doing it with public school dollars, they're training them. Uh, and it, it has to do with selection and promotion and, and retention uh, as well as professional development. So, so you're, you're absolutely right there. And we can do that in our traditional public schools and in fact uh, we've been working hard to put in place legislation uh, that looks at teacher and principal uh, evaluation and quality and different ways of placing and promoting teachers and principals in our traditional public schools and making sure that there's professional development that goes along with these new evaluations. So there are a number of practices that have been very prominent and prevalent in um, public charter schools that, w that are being transferred to traditional public schools. Uh, and the other thing that we do need to continue to look at is we need to look at uh, our education schools and, and to make sure that we're treating educators with respect, but we're also putting our best and our brightest students into education and then promoting them in, into uh, the teaching and uh, administrative profession. So I, complete, I, I completely concur. Teacher quality, we can't 
educate our students without effective teachers and principals. It's absolutely essential. And there are prominent and very effective practices that occur both in traditional public schools as well as in public charter schools. Uh, so, so we need to keep doing that. I, I don't agree, I've said it a number of times, that, uh, that, that Washington's public charter schools won't work with students with disabilities and won't work with them effectively. Uh, we need to make sure, and, and the, the initiative has stipulated that there's strict oversight and accountability, and that's where we as a public come in. Uh, and making sure that there are parents on the charter school boards and, uh, uh, and, and other community members who are really providing that strict o oversight and accountability just as we do when we go to our traditional public school um, uh, school board meetings. So they're, they're good points. Um, I'm going to take that last point first. Um, parent oversight. There's a suggestion that there be one parent on the uh, Charter School Commission. Um, other than that, there's absolutely no requirement whatsoever for any parental oversight for the charter schools. It, there aren't. There really aren't. Local charter schools, the parent involvement, community involvement. Parent involvement, it, the charter schools have to define in their charter what they intend for their charter school parent involvement to be. Um, that may be volunteering, that they, they uh, expect parents to spend some time in the classroom. That may be other things. They may actually have a half a dozen parents on the board, but there's not a requirement of any kind that parents be on the charter school board. Now, getting back to your question of training, um, we, we absolutely need to have better teachers. I would love for us to have a situation like Finland does, where the top 10% of people have the option of going to education college and becoming teachers. But we're not there. We don't have that respect for the profession. We don't have that kind of pay for teachers. Um, we don't need charter schools to get there. Charter schools will not magically make the top 10% of everybody decide to go become a teacher. Um, we need to have our entire system work better for the teachers to make that happen. Thank you. Um, Alice, if you would. Alice? When you began, you introduced yourself as executive director of an organization whose name I did not catch. Could you tell me the name of that organization and how that organization is funded? Sure. So the organization is called Partnership for Learning, founded in 1994. As I mentioned, we're an affiliate of the Washington Roundtable, which uh, is a group of major corporations from throughout Washington State. Uh, they pay member dues to be part of the Roundtable. Uh, we're in part funded through foundations and in part funded through member company uh, contributions. We don't get any money from, um, we don't do private fundraising other than uh, with foundations. Government? No, no government, no. Um, we're working, we work in partnership, for example, with the Office of Superintendent of Public Instruction, where right now um, we have a grant from College Spark Foundation to communicate about the Common Core Standards and to work with parents uh, and families to better understand what, what's going to be required, uh, what the results might show. So we work very closely with um, the public sector, but we're not funded by the public sector. Okay, thank you. Um, Gail? Gail? So I have about half a dozen questions and I'm gonna work into one question. <laughs> um, you talked a lot, Jenna, about um, struggling students. And it was, it is these struggling students who need different options. But then I heard that there's no, these schools are not being placed in struggling neighborhoods. Because they can be placed wherever a, a charter school wants to be placed. So really, we could vote this in and our struggling students may not actually get the help because... But. Excuse me. So there are, just like when um, we had public schools of choice in Seattle, 
Um, it's incumbent on the community and on the providers of education to get information out to low-income, uh, less well-resourced communities and to translate materials into multiple languages, to reach out, to go uh, into those communities and to talk to them. And that's absolutely um, incumbent on the providers to do. And, and there, again, if you're, we're recruiting providers who serve English language learner students who are immigrants or first generation, they're very unlikely to settle in Bellevue. Uh, they're much more likely to settle in the roadmap region, which is uh, where we have um, 37 hundreds of different languages spoken in Highline, in Tukwila, in a number of these different communities. So yeah, there's, there's work to do, there's communication, there's, uh, uh, there are a lot of community organizations who already do this work, and it would mean working with and through them, as well as when examining charters, to make sure that the communication practices are very much focused on the communities they're looking to serve. Eric, do you want to add anything? Yeah, and, and what it sounded like from your question is that you were looking for a guarantee, um, or a not, not necessarily a guarantee, but at least a, a very strong recommendation. And there's, I'm gonna, I'm gonna roll on that here. Um, there's some recommendations in the preamble, but when you get to the text that you actually have to follow, um, there are no recommend, there, there are no requirements. You don't have to put charter schools where they're serving at-risk students. Um, they're free to innovate and, and be successful with, with the children of Magnolia and Mercer Island and, and uh, North Ballard. Um, there's no requirements there. Um, Jen also brought up the issue of public oversight and accountability, and that brings us back to the Charter Commission. Um, you may have charter schools authorized by school boards or the Charter Commission. School boards can be removed as authorizers if they're failing in their duties as, as an authorizer, or they're failing to give oversight. The State Board of Education can remove them. Nobody can remove the Charter Commission. Those people get appointed, and they serve their term until that, that term is up, and then they get, uh, somebody else gets appointed in, in that spot. There is absolutely no public accountability there other than people uh, with pitchforks and torches in the streets. Okay, one more question, and I think we one more question, and I think we then have imposed enough on our uh, on our participants. So this is the last question. I've been concerned ever since we had the voucher study thirty-five years ago. I think before you were in Seattle, that people who had the skills, the experience, and the confidence to separate their children to different schools to have something for coming home afterwards, to not have the older child responsible for the younger child, cannot make those choices very well. And so I wonder if you can give me some specific examples of how charter schools have reached out to families like this so they're willing to take the risk, which is a huge risk for them, to try something as different as an alternative to where they, everyone in their community is going. Well, I think the fact that there are thousands of students on waiting lists across the country in urban areas where charter schools are um, placed is noteworthy. Uh, and, and we're not talking about vouchers. Uh, so it's, uh, I, so I, I, I think that the demand and the um, lack of supply speaks volumes for uh, why and how students can either be empowered, and when you give them options, uh, that empowers them. When you give them information, that empowers them. And having worked quite a bit with urban families and, and their children, um, it's providing them with respect, it's providing them with information, and it's providing them with the option. They don't have that right now. Um, and so, so, I mean, I can get you more direct statistics, but, but they do. People don't have to choose a charter school, and they are, and they are in vast numbers. And every state that did, uh, most, most states, by the way, have started with what's called a charter school cap. 
uh, which means only a limited number uh, for a certain amount of time. Every state that had a cap has actually increased its cap. Uh, and again, that's based on the demand. And charter schools, I mean, so, so we have 25% of Seattle public, uh, excuse me, Seattle students attend private schools right now. So we, we already have what's called economic choice. We have a lot of people choosing not to participate in Seattle public schools. These would still be public schools, and it's providing an innovative option for, for those families, and it's providing them in, in their neighborhoods. And I think we can see that while um, there's some concern about the not being located in a neighborhood, when, when you look at urban school districts, they already have city, many of them have citywide secondary choice and they're using the public transportation to get around. Uh, and so that already is in precedent even here in the city. And I actually personally was pretty put out when we went back on choice because then you end up, uh, the people no longer have the, the choice for the better schools. They're, they're stuck in their neighborhoods where there may be low performing schools. Those of us who don't live in the South End don't, don't have that. We, we have broader choice and broader choice of higher performing schools. And this is putting the schools in, in the areas where uh, the students most need them. Eric, anything to add? Yes. Um, as, as usual. Um, I think. One point I want to make is that Seattle right now does have choice. Um, right now, the students who feel that they're not being served well at Garfield by the, um, by the, the uh, for lack of a better term, segregation, although that's a, that's a terrible word, between the APP students and the, um, and the rest of the community, have every right to go up to Ingram. Um, they can ask for that transfer, and uh, there's no waiting list at Ingram right now if they want to be, if they want to be in a different school that offers different options. Um, I will say, though, that there are certainly hundreds of students on wait lists within Seattle schools who are trying to get into uh, schools in other areas. Um, so the, the existence of wait lists doesn't necessarily um, mean that, that, uh, that charter schools are necessarily better. There are, there's demand and wait lists for excellent schools everywhere. Um, Kira School has 20 to 30 kids on the wait list right now. Um, so we have options. We don't need charter schools to have better, to have more and better options. Our system has lots of options. We, we um, North End, we have uh, Tops, we have Salmon Bay. Uh, South End, we have uh, Madrona. We have Nova uh, High School. We have um, South Shore. Those are all option schools. Um, and those are places where people can choose to send their children for a better uh, educational experience. And if there's more questions, I'd be happy to take them off to the side as well. Okay. Um, why don't I give you each a, a minute to sort of summarize and end up and do it. Thank you. You've all been uh, very uh, <clears throat> articulate and very interested and also very gracious in your questioning. And I, I respect that. It's a great democratic process. And I, I applaud you for uh, bringing us out and really considering the issues. And, and I, it's, it's up to you how you vote, how you tell your friends to vote. And I just ask you to think deeply about the issue and think deeply about Washington State and what we need in Washington State and why options uh, of this sort may that, that we shouldn't have them here and that certain families shouldn't have them. Uh, so that's all I, I ask of you. And again, I applaud you for, for bringing us both here and ask you to, to think about it. Uh, and I do have some fact sheets here as well if you'd like more information. Thank you again. Um, I, uh, like Jana said, I really appreciate your spending this much time. This is the, I've done this several times. This is the longest we've spent on a, any particular issue. So I really appreciate your time and your questions. Um, the question isn't whether we want choice. Um, the question isn't really whether we want charters. The question is whether Initiative 1240 here is the best way to get us that choice and is the best way to bring us charters. Unfortunately, we can't vote on the idea of charters. We have to vote on what the initiative is. Um, the initiative has a lot of recommendations. It doesn't have a lot of requirements. 
Um, what I would suggest, and, and as you're thinking about this, is that we think about where we are in school funding and work on fixing that first. Um, 41 other states have charter schools. We're number 45, 46, 47 in, um, in school funding uh, uh, nationwide. Um, it's no accident that our schools are failing us because we're not giving them the resources they need to succeed. So I encourage you to vote no. Thank you. Well, thank you very much. Well, I want to thank you. Uh, that, really, that really is a great discussion and really gives you both sides of the issue. So thank you both very much for coming. We appreciate it. And uh, we wish you both well. Uh, and uh, we'll see what happens uh, at the end of the round 15, I guess. So, thanks, Cor. <laughs> <laughs>